Pravit Moy Druzy. Hello, my friends. My name is Darren Gertis. I'm a professor who tries to help you understand what's going on in Ukraine and, and provide the context of like why are certain things happening as they're happening. And so yesterday I was talking about why lie about stupid stuff. And I was trying to understand like why are they lying about the date in which Putin visited in Kherson and in um, uh, Luhansk Oblast. Uh, today, I want to talk about why Putin is a chicken hawk. And when I say chicken hawk, I don't mean the actual bird, and I don't mean the precise meaning of the term. So the precise meaning of the term in American politics is somebody who's really hawkish about the military as a politician, but they fail to serve or try to dodge the draft. Usually it talks about like in Vietnam, for example, they dodge the draft in Vietnam, but then they are really hawkish about the military. I mean it in a more general sense, like someone who talks tough, but then really is not taking any risks. Okay. So that's what I mean by a chicken hawk. I think I have some answers for you about Putin. It's not completely developed, but it's a little bit better than where it was yesterday. I just, I couldn't piece together why Putin would act the way that he did. And I addressed that yesterday. And here's what I said. He's, he's doubling down because, and, and I would expect him to double down. This is the way that dictators behave. But why lie about something so stupid? I, I just can't get my mind around. Now, I think I understand what I couldn't wrap my mind around yesterday about why lie about something so stupid. So just follow me for a little bit. I don't quite have it fully, but I have it like almost there. So yesterday, as I was showing you one of the articles in that video, that's this why lie about stupid stuff. Um, we went through this BBC news article and at the very end they said, it has also been said that the Russian defense minister, Sergei Shogu and chief of general staff, Valery Gerasimov did not accompany the president on the trip as it was a big risk for Russia's top commanders to be in one place so close to the front lines. And I said, so close to the front lines, right? I said, there. now, just because they're saying it's so close to the front lines, it's not that close to the front lines. It can't, I mean, that's just not how the, if, if they said it, then it's almost like they're telegraphing. They're not actually there. Okay. So with that being said, I'm going to show you a video from uh, Sky News where they're actually kind of diagnosing why, why Putin would have done what he did and, and that kind of thing. So here we go. Why? What's the aim? Is it the optics of it? Is to sh is it to show that he's not afraid to travel inside Ukraine? What's the what's the overall Probably aim? Probably D, all of the above. <laughs> okay. I suspect um, the, the war is not going well for uh, for Russia here. Um, Russia ceded mm -hmm. over fifty percent of the territory that it had taken. It's had massive casualties. It's also lost a huge amount of equipment, potentially two thirds of its main battle tanks, over two thousand main battle tanks, and it's got this Ukrainian counteroffensive to come. So against all of that, President Putin will want to be seen as a strong leader. He wants to be demonstrated. He's in control. He's been in a dark suit. He's been visiting his military commanders, holding court and lots of direction there. He's also probably tipping in a nod to the International Criminal Court, which obviously indicted him, uh, threatened him with arrest. And he's just showing the international community, I can still travel wherever I want to. But let's be quite well, clear, this is almost certainly about... Kind of. I mean, kind of. I mean, he's still traveling with an, in a place where nobody can actually put their hands on him um, because even if it's – he technically calls it Russia when it's still Ukraine, it's still occupied in such a way that he can't – you know, nobody can get him. But let's go on. About raising domestic confidence. I'm in control. The war is going as planned mainly because and Russia – the domestic confidence point is very, very big in this. Keep going. It desperately needs to get more soldiers to volunteer and join the military mm -hmm. because they've had such a, a hard time of it late. All of these visits, though, are very carefully choreographed. That's yep. why we're not quite sure of the actual uh, timing of it all for an internal messaging. And uh, But what we do know is almost certainly President Putin didn't end up talking to the frontline troops that were involved in the fighting, particularly around Bakhmut. Because if he had done, he probably, A, wouldn't have liked to hear what they had to say, and B, they probably were a bit of a risk to Putin himself. Now, that's fascinating. He didn't talk to frontline troops, and I pointed that out yesterday, and he would, probably would have put himself at risk for what he's done to them. Okay, so here is Putin's visit to occupied part of Herzan, Ukraine's geolocated to this place I probably am going to slaughter the pronunciation, Shlazvistevi. Okay, so this is liveuamap.com, and when you follow this link from liveuamap.com, it brings you to this. Now, where is this? This is Herzan. This is Crimea. 
See how close to the front line he actually is here? I mean, it's unbelievable. Let's look at a deep state map because I can map with it, okay? And I'll show you how far he is. He could literally see from where from where he is, this measurement from here to here, this is the border of Crimea. He could literally see that's 16.5 kilometers. 16.5 kilometers is about eight miles. Okay, for those of you that need to translate to miles like I do, um, yeah, he could literally see Crimea from where he was. He was hardly on the front line. Here's another view of this. This is where he was. This is Crimea. Here's the Ukrainian front line. It is 140 kilometers. 140 kilometers is uh, about 86 miles, 87 miles, something in that neighborhood. So he's far enough out of Ukrainian range that he's not in any danger at all. This is why I say, you know, chicken hawk. Was he really taking any risk of anything at all? No, not hardly. Okay, so here's the deep state map again. See how far he is from uh, uh, Bakhmut. Bakhmut's where the hard fighting is right now, 326 miles. Okay, so our kilometers, and that's 202 miles. Where was Zelensky when he was in Bakhmut? He was just outside the city. Where was he just a couple of days ago? And that's really the question. So here's the deep state map again. He also visited somewhere in Luhansk as well. And so, uh, but my guess, it's somewhere near the border, Belgorod or something along those lines, out of harm's way. Okay, so the next thing that I want to show you is this. This is the ISW they came out yesterday, the Institute for the Study of War. Russian President Vladimir Putin continued to portray himself as a wartime leader in anticipation of a planned Ukrainian counteroffensive during his visit to occupied Herzan and Luhansk Oblast. Yes, he's a chicken hawk, right? I mean, he's talking all this big stuff, but he's really kind of not actually putting himself in any danger. Whereas, what was Zelensky doing? And this also answers kind of the question of why it came out when it came out. The Kremlin announced on April 18th that Putin visited the headquarters of the Russian the Dnepr Group Forces at Kurzan Oblast and the Vostok National Guard headquarters in occupied Luhansk Oblast. Dmitry Peskov claimed that Putin visited the occupied territories on April 17th. He visited The visit occurred prior to April 16th. But why? Like, why lie about stupid stuff? That's what I was asking. I think we have an answer. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky visited Advika frontline on April 18th, and it's possible that the Kremlin deliberately released footage of President uh, Putin's visit to overshadow Zelensky's visit in the information space. Well, that's really interesting. So let's look at this article here. This is a UPI article, Zelensky to visit at the heavily Russian shelled frontline town of Advika. Well, where's Advika? Advika is kind of like Bakhmut. It's one of those pockets where there's some significant fighting. Down here is Advika, kind of surrounded, right, on the front lines. Like, literally, this is front line kind of thing. And here's Bakhmut, the other place that's, like, really even more frontline-ish, right? So look where Zelensky placed himself, and let's look at where Putin placed himself. He placed himself this far, 140 kilometers behind the front line. So that's what's going on. Now, there's a few unanswered questions yet. So how did they know that Zelensky was going to be there on the 18th? Or were they staging this so that they could use this later on? Or was there more to it? Well, here's a little bit more to it, and I hope this helps you understand what's going on in some of the context. So, so Russian occupation officials and mill bloggers celebrated Putin's visit and claimed that he boosted the morale of Russian servicemen preparing to repel Ukrainian counteroffensives. Geolocated footage shows that Putin visited the Arabic spit in south southwestern Herzan Oblast, at least 130 kilometers from the nearest front line. My calculation was, you know, 140 kilometers, but that's still only a, like a couple mile difference. Um, and, and that's just, you know, using this as the crow flies, right? From as close as I could find here to as close as I could find there. Nevertheless, it's still a long, long way. Okay. Um, Putin's visit is also intended to publicly identify potential scapegoats ahead of the planned Ukrainian counteroffensive. Now, this rings true because they, they operate like this where, you know, Putin is always looking for somebody below him to blame when things go wrong. So that he met with the commander of the Russian Airborne Forces and the commander of the Dnepr Group Forces. And he also met with Colonel General Alexander Lepin. The people that he met with are the ones in danger of being scapegoated. Putin 
Kremlin sources and mill bloggers have increasingly discuss been discussing uh, prospects for a Ukrainian counteroffensive, and it's likely that the Kremlin is preparing the domestic information space for either military failures or the defeat of a counteroffensive threat. So, uh, <laughs> like, if you met with Putin, um, you either have to win or you're going to be the, you know, to blame for this is what it looks like. Putin's dem uh, demonstrative meetings with Toplinsky, Makarevich, and Lapin likely confirm another change in military command and possibly with the Kremlin's inner circle. So there's also, again, all this infighting going on that we've been talking about and talking about. Um, Mill blogger claimed that Toplinsky and Lapin, both of whom have reportedly been placed on a leave, returned to the Russian military command, likely against the wishes of Gerasimov and Shogu. So Putin's overriding and putting these other guys in place. The ISW previously assessed that the Plinsky's confirmed reappointment suggests that the Kremlin is likely seeking to work with Wagner to achieve a decisive victory in Bakhmut. The confirmation may further indicate that Prigozhin has at least partly regained Putin's favor by overriding Gerasimov and Shogu's efforts to eliminate Wag Wagner in Bakhmut. So that's absolutely fascinating stuff. And, you know, I've been looking at this and looking at this and trying to understand what's going on. And I think that answers a big piece of the puzzle. The only thing I, I don't quite understand is how would they know that Zelensky is going to visit or did they just do this and have it canned so that when something happened, they could show that, that Putin was actually on the ground visiting his commanders. But it makes a lot of sense about why they lie about stupid stuff. And it also makes a lot of sense that, you know, Putin's kind of a chicken hawk. I mean, he, he really is. All right. I hope that helps you understand things. I hope that helps you um, have a better sense of what uh, of all the moving parts, because there's a lot of them. Thank you very much for caring about this topic long enough to be hearing me even now. Thank you for buying me coffees. Thank you for being the kind of person that cares about Ukraine.